Hello, welcome back to 54M. Last week we talked about memory. We looked at how we can think about voltage as a high or low value, representing a one or a zero. So we can abstract the electricity away and think about this in terms of binary. We then looked at how we can group these bits into bytes of eight bits. And using a byte, we can store the values zero to 255. And finally, we looked at how RAM can be considered as one long array of index addressable bytes. If you haven't seen that video, you can see that by clicking here somewhere. Today, what we're gonna look at is how we can use these numbers to store characters and text. If all we have available to us is binary numbers, how do we store more complex things like characters and text? The answer is encoding. Encoding means to represent one thing while displaying another. For example, secret codes or computer code. As long as we know the scheme by which our data is encoded, we can always decode it and derive the original meaning of it. If we want to store text, there are a couple of different ways that we could encode it. One method used to encode text is to swap one character for another. For example, this is the Caesar cipher, where every letter is shuffled three to the right in the alphabet thereby encoding the meaning of a message. For example, cab would become FDE. But by knowing the scheme of encoding, we can decode the message later, deriving the original CAB cab message. Characters can also be encoded as numbers. For example, in this case, every letter of the alphabet is given its corresponding index number. CAB cab would become 312. And if we receive the message 312, we would be able to decode it to get the message cab. Hopefully this last idea has set a light bulb off in your mind because we can store numbers. We know how to do that. We can store numbers in memory. So could we use them to represent our characters? Yes, we could. In fact, this is exactly how it works. All we need to do is define a scheme to represent these characters with specified numbers. One of the simplest and earliest schemes for representing characters is the ASCII scheme. ASCII was developed here in the late 1960s and uses seven or eight bits to represent all the English characters and punctuation, including upper and lowercase characters. This is a snippet of the ASCII table, showing you on the left-hand side some of the values for uppercase characters and on the right-hand side the same values for lowercase characters. One nice feature of ASCII is that a lowercase character and its uppercase variant have a difference of 32, which is true for every character in the alphabet. Therefore, in order to convert between an uppercase character and its lowercase variant, all you need to do is toggle the sixth smallest bit. ASCII also needs to be able to represent numerals. A numeral character, for example, the number five, is actually represented by decimal 53 rather than 5. The reason that these numbers as characters aren't represented by the numbers themselves is because these lower numbers are actually used in ASCII as codes for more important values. Therefore, in order to store 0 as a character as part of a string, we use the decimal value 48. As a side note, it's very common to use this 0B notation in front of a binary number to notify the reader that it is indeed a binary number that we're looking at. Equally, hexadecimal notation uses 0X in front of its number to specify that this is a hexadecimal based number that we're looking at. So we can represent a character with eight bits, one byte, we can represent one character using ASCII. When we read that byte, as long as our program knows the byte represents an ASCII character, we can decode it and find out what the character actually was. So how about a string? For example, how do we represent the string hello? So we can see the value of each character here as an ASCII character. We could store each character next to one another by taking the binary value of each character according to its ASCII code we can place each character in a contiguous byte. H104 would go in byte 700, E101 would go in 701, L, which is 108, 
would go in bytes 702 and 703, and O, which is code 111, would be stored in byte 704. So now we know how we could store a string of characters in memory, by storing the ASCII code of each character in the string in consecutive bytes. Now, how does our program read strings? We could give our program a pointer to the first character. In this case, the pointer would be to byte 700. The program could go to byte 700 and read the value. It would decode the value against the ASCII table and get the character H. Then the program would have to look at the next byte, 701. It would get the value there and decode it as an E according to the ASCII table. This process would continue. Next, it would go to 702, continuing its journey, decoding an L in 702 and in 703. Then it would go to byte 704 and decode an O, getting the string hello that we stored there previously. As long as the program knew that we were using the ASCII encoding, then it would have no problem taking the binary values stored at each byte, looking it up against the ASCII value, and getting the correct character as a result. Our pointer has continued this journey, incrementing one from each byte to the next, reading the value stored at that address. What happens when it reaches 705? Our message is finished. We stored nothing in 705, and we want the pointer to stop. We want to stop reading any more values. What happens if there's a value at 705? For example, a random value might give us a random character, and the pointer would continue, giving us an incorrect message. There definitely will be a value at 705. It could be more data that our program is storing, or data that another program is storing, or it could be no data at all, set there by the garbage of electricity. There is always something at every memory address. Whether it means something to us, or whether it's completely random data, there is always something at every address. You might know it's nothing that we want to care about, but the computer can't tell the difference. So the computer, it's just more light bulbs. Your data and all other data, this is the classic challenge of memory storage and management. Anything can be stored there. Memory is a blunt object. Just a long, long collection of those light bulbs. But it's up to the program and the programmer to determine what those light bulbs mean, which ones we care about and which ones we don't. So how do we tell our program to stop at 704? There are essentially three options. We could use a byte at the start of the string to tell the program how long the string is. If the program knew the length of the string, it would know when to stop. This is the approach taken by the Java programming language. The problem is that as our string grows, so does the size of this number. If our string is more than 255 characters long, then we'd need two bytes. And as it goes, we'd need ever more bytes. Our program would need to know how many of these bytes were representing the length of the string rather than the string characters themselves. Java uses four bytes to represent the length of its strings, which is over four billion characters. There's never been a book published to date with more than four billion characters in, although a number of networking textbooks are getting pretty close. A second option is to store the length separately from the string. This is very similar to the previous approach, but it circumvents the problem of having to know how many bytes represent the length of the string itself. This is the approach JavaScript takes. The final approach is to store some kind of stop character, like telegrams from the 1890s. By placing this character at the end of the string, when our program reaches it, we know our string is over and we can stop. We've got our message. This approach is nice because it works regardless of the length of the string, and we don't need to store any other values in order for it to work. We just keep checking bytes and reading characters until we hit this stop value. In ASCII, the stop character is known as the null character, and it is represented by the binary value zero. It's also written as a backslash zero. This is to denote that it doesn't represent the numeral zero, but rather this stop or null character. When the program reads a byte, 
and gets the value zero, it knows the string is terminated. By placing this null value at byte 705, we can terminate the string after the O, representing the string hello in six bytes. Five letters and one null character. And that is how we store strings, encoded as binary numbers and stored in consecutive bytes of memory. In the next video, we'll be talking about how we can store decimals, fractions and negative numbers. Until then, thanks for watching. This was 54M and I'll see you soon.